You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Welcome to yet another exciting edition of your combination NXT audio report and your Cruiserweight Classic audio report for Wednesday, July 27, 2016. My name is Ari Whitner, and we're going to kick things off with NXT. This was one of those shows that, you know, NXT has these shows about once a month or so where you just get a whole bunch of short wrestling matches and a little bit of storyline progression. And normally it's one of those shows that if you missed it, just move on. Just, you know, skip it, move on the next week. But this had a really good main event segment. So at the very least, you know, watch the main event. Um, so we're going to kick things off with Wesley Blake uh, versus the King of Strong Style, Shinsuke Nakamura. Uh, Blake got his first name back now that he's apart from Murphy. Uh, but he did, like I said, lose both his teammate and his manager and his theme music as he now has this weird, moody theme song that, you know, sounds like he's trying to be emo or some. Thing. Um, we did see a video from quote unquote earlier today where Blake and Murphy argued. Blake said he would beat Nakamura, and Murphy said that he would later tonight he would beat Kota Ibushi. Spoiler alert: both of these men are liars. Um, the fans first sang uh, Nakamura's theme song before uh, breaking down into a simple "Let's Go Shinsuke" chant. Blake did a rolling leapfrog over Nakamura and blew kisses at the former IWGP champion. Nakamura caught the kisses, dropped them on the ground, and stomped them. You know, man, I, I don't know. You know, Stomping on another man's kisses that he sends you. I don't know, kid. But anyway, Blake got a little bit of offense, but tonight was not his night. Nakamura won with the Reverse Exploder and the Kinshasa. Out came my personal hero, the general manager of NXT, Mr. William Regal, and announced that the main event of NXT TakeOver Brooklyn on August 20th will be Samoa Joe defending the NXT Championship against Shinsuke Nakamura. No offense to Dolph Dean, Brock, Grandy, Seth, and Finn. This is the match I'm looking forward to on SummerSlam weekend. We had a quick cameo by Of Mice and Men, who did a shout out to NXT for using one of their songs as the official theme song of NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 2. We then had a former TNA knockout, Santana Garrett versus former SmackDown jobber for one night, Billy Kay. Something that I was unaware of, but apparently a few weeks ago in SmackDown, Billy Kay appeared and did a three-minute job to Dana Brooke. Apparently, the three minutes of fame went to Billy Kay's head, because the story was that she was bragging about her, uh, the fact that she was on SmackDown. Um... I'd like to imagine that even though I've never myself lost a three-minute TV match, I wouldn't be running around bragging about it either. Anyway, this is one of those matches that makes you realize that the NXT Women's Division is really needing to be rebuilt, and Billy won with a big boot. Bailey was backstage talking to Mr. Regal in his office. Uh, she was basically asking for another title shot, and she wants the title shot in Brooklyn, where she won it the first time. And Mr. Eagle said he loves the idea, and as long as Oscar's okay with it, they will draw up the paperwork and have a contract signing. Now, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but it's kind of weird that um, in this scenario, uh, Mr. Eagle's only going to make the match as long as Oscar was okay with it. However, later on in the show, Samoa Joe was quite angry that uh, Mr. Regal just named Nakamura his top contender without getting Joe's opinion or approval of the match. Anyway, we then had a video package for someone who I'm 99% sure is Rhino. 
Um, all they did was show a shadowy figure crouching in high grass while a National Geographic type sounding guy did a voiceover. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was Rhino, um, but, you know, it could have been somebody else, I guess. TM61 is back. The Mighty 61, one-on-one -on, -one on, on TV so far. Uh, will Nick Miller and Shane Thorne improve to two-in-one? Well, if Rob Ryzen and Adrian Nails have anything to say about it, they won't. And, spoiler alert, they didn't have anything to say about it. Um, Ryzen looked decent here, um, and the heels got the heat on Thorne, but Thorne made the hot tag to Miller uh, when Ryzen and Nails missed two corner splashes. Miller and Thorne took over and won quickly with Thunder Valley. I should point out that Adrian Nails' ring gear uh, was ripped jeans that he wore black knee pads over. They showed uh, the build-up so far to Austin Aries and No Way Jose, including uh, Aries and Jose dancing before Aries turned on him a month ago, and then Jose returning last week to cause Aries to run out of the building. Hideo Itami returns next week. Like I mentioned last week, I really doubt we're going to find out who randomly attacked and injured him right before NXT TakeOver Unstoppable, um, a little over a year ago. No Way Jose was up next in the ring to go one-on-one -on -one with Steve Cutler. Uh, we don't know much about Steve Cutler, except his last name rhymes with Butler, and if he wins, then the Cutler will have done it. Anyway, Cutler has Lash LaRue sideburns and a theme song that includes a dog barking. Why does he have a theme song that includes dogs barking? Who knows? Maybe we'll eventually find out. But anyway, Cutler angered Jose by shoving him, which caused Jose to flip his lid, uh, winning the match with his wind-up punch and the Cobra Clutch Slam. So, news flash to Austin Aries. If you want a uh, shot in your match coming up, which I'm assuming you two are going to wrestle soon, um, don't shove No Way Jose. He does not like being shoved. After the match, Jose took the mic and cut a promo on Aries. Jose said he was he just came out a few weeks ago to give some good vibes to Aries, but he took advantage and when Air and when he showed that Aries took advantage of Jose, beat him down, and when Jose showed Aries that he could fight, the greatest man who ever lived turned into the biggest coward in NXT. Noah Jose vowed to whoop Austin Aries' ass. Buddy Murphy was out next to go one-on-one -on -one with the NXT debuting Kota Ibushi. I should point out in the Blake and Murphy divorce proceedings, Buddy Murphy was allowed to keep the dubstep music. I wonder what Alexa got to keep and all that. Kota Ibushi, I want to point out, used the same Titan Tron graphic as used for him for the CWC, and the fans popped for the genuine surprise of seeing Ibushi uh, doing an NXT match. I should point out, WWE now has Nakamura, Ibushi, Styles, Gallows, Anderson, and Shelton Benjamin, all of whom competed in recent G1 climaxes. I wonder if New Japan at this point is going to go and start rating people who have been in the Royal Rumble. Well, I guess they have Yoshitatsu, but I mean Yoshitatsu was in the match for like 30 seconds. Murphy looked good here, but he fared the same against Ibushi that he did against Nakamura. Uh, Murphy kicked Ibushi in the face, so Ibushi kicked his head clean off his shoulders um, and used both a bridging German suplex and then picked up the win with a sit-out powerbomb. Samoa Joe finally arrived at the building 45 minutes into the show, where he was informed of his match with Nakamura TakeOver. Joe was angry about the disrespect showed to him and vowed to go fix this. Um, we, were show, we were informed that Bobby Roode will finally make his debut next week on NXT. That only took him, what, five months? Um, main event segment time. Makes you wonder, again, if wrestling was real... What did they plan to do if Samoa Joe just never bothered to show up for the show tonight? 
Would they have just ended the show at 45 minutes after the hour? Anyway, the champ is here in the building. Moody Samoa Joe storms to the ring to address the disrespect of being informed of his upcoming title match the way he was. Um, By the way, again, he arrived at the arena 45 minutes into the one-hour show. At that point, why did he even bother going? Anyway, Joe informed us that the match with Nakamura will not be happening due to Nakamura being an undeserving challenger and not going through what Joe did to get the title. Just as I was about to point out that Joe almost literally had to jump through hoops, he pointed out that he had to jump through hoop after hoop after hoop just to get title matches. Mr. Regal came out and said that his decisions are final and Joe will fight who he tells him to fight. Uh, Joe told William that he has one opportunity to fix this. He recommends that they go back to Mr. Regal's office and have a mutual discussion over who Joe should face and come to a conclusion, specifically one, of someone that Joe approves of. Mr. Eagle told him that if he does not fight Nakamura, then he'll be stripped of the championship belt, and he uh, will then choose another contender to face Nakamura for the vacant title. Joe angrily told him that he's got the match, and that this is the biggest mistake that Regal has ever made. He decimated Finn Balor, and at NXT TakeOver, he'll do the same to Nakamura. Just as Mr. Regal turned to leave, Joe threatened to destroy Nakamura before Brooklyn, which brought out our spastic number one contender. Uh, Nakamura stood on top of the ramp, staring down the champion, who was shaking in anger. And that was it for NXT. An excellent, excellent main event segment that made you want to watch a main event match that you already wanted to see even more. And in case 10 hours in uh, four days of WWE just wasn't enough for you, hour number 11, the WWE Cruiserweight Classic. I just thought to myself, thankfully, I haven't had a whole lot of stuff to fill up my DVR with lately. Do you know how hard it is to avoid spoilers for the Cruiserweight Classic? Last week in the Wrestling Observer, Dave Meltzer had a lengthy section, which was chock full of spoilers, that I had to skip the entire section because I don't want to know what happens. It reminded me of the time way back when, when no one watched NXT except for me, and then randomly on Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave blurted out who won the NXT title tournament before it completed on TV, which, by the way, was Seth Rollins. Kick things off with Zack Sabre Jr. versus Tyson Dukes. Dukes injured his knee on an episode of Velocity in 2004, wrestling Mark Jindrak, and something tells me he was neither the first nor the last person to be injured wrestling Jindrak. Uh, T and, uh, I'm sorry, Duck, this is that Dukes, was actually in TNA for a cup of coffee in 2006. And yes, I really do remember everything. Mauro Ronaldo said Dukes continued to be a freelance wrestler after his knee injury, which, you know, of all the ways you could say an independent wrestler, a freelance wrestler is actually one of the cooler ways to say it. Um, Sabre used a very unique twisting wrist lock on Dukes, which looked quite painful. Uh, Saber used the Cesaro middle rope uppercut and got little reaction. He did get some O's with an arm bar and then a Pele kick to said arm. Uh, Saber used an octopus hold and pulled Dukes' hand backwards. Uh, Dukes did make the ropes. And yes, folks, Dukes did get a bit of offense in this match. But this was all about Saber. Uh, Saber won with the Uma Plata. Dukes' hands were occupied, so the referee had to accept a verbal submission. And Sabre will now go on to face the winner of our next match, Drew Gulak versus Harv Sira. It's Harv Sira, not to be confused with Harv Shira, which I kept saying and writing for the longest time. Anyway, Sira was, uh, broke out the most exciting move of the first 30 minutes of the show when he used a springboard dive to the outside on Gulak. 
Uh, like with the first match, this was solid yet unspectacular. Uh, Gulak slapped on the Dragon Sleeper. Sira tried to get out of it with an ankle lock, but Gulak wrenched on that Dragon Sleeper even deeper for the tap out, with Daniel Bryan selling it as the most brutal submission in the Cruiserweight Classic. Tony Nice was up next, going one on one with Anthony Bennett. Nice was another person who was in TNA for a cup of coffee. Anthony Bennett um, is a very, very small, very, very skinny man um, with very, very tall hair. Think someone the size of WCW Rey Mysterio. Um, and we actually have a little bit of a faux pas where in uh, Bennett's video package, they said he was five foot four, 147 pounds, and then Mauro Ronaldo uh, claimed him to be two inches taller and two pounds skinnier uh, when he had his match. Um, Bennett, I should point out, had a pair of sunglasses in his hair as he was coming out, and that may have been the highlight for Mr. Bennett, as this was not his night. He uh, was very sloppy when on offense. Uh, nice did his best to hold the match together and did good in that regard, but this was a very sloppy match at times. Uh, Bennett just looked bad, and the right man won, let's just say that. Uh, nice used a pump handle slam where uh, Be uh, Bennett landed wrong and almost injured himself. Uh, but the referee allowed the match to continue, and Nice won with a 450 splash, and he will face the winner of the main event, Raul Mendoza, and the returning, the Brian Kendrick. Kendrick got his name as a rib on Mike Adamley, who, uh, when he was an announcer, kept calling people and things the and the that didn't need the word the or the in front of, um, like his former broadcast partner, the Taz. Uh, by the way, that's my second Mike Adamley joke of the day. Just want to point that out. Kendrick looked good here, and Mendoza looked even better. Uh, Mendoza used this move that was like an upside-down Cesaro swing that ended with a submission hold. Um, even though the video packages had them as different, Kendrick wrestled as the heel in this match, uh, Mendoza being the baby face. Uh, Kendrick busted Mendoza's mouth wide open with a kick to the yap, um, which was actually, you know, it was almost set up that way because Mendoza then used that to make his comeback, um, hitting a beautiful corkscrew planche in the meantime. Mendoza used a coast-to-coast -coast corner drop kick, almost won with a suplex into the double knees to the back, but Kendrick got his feet on the ropes. Kendrick pretended to be injured, but did it just so he could lure Mendoza in before winning with a bully choke, which is a side headlock takeover into a rear choke. So that does it for the CWC. We're down to our last four first round matches next week, and then we move on to the round of 16. But that's going to do it from here. I want to thank everyone for listening. And I'll talk to you again in seven days. You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network.